you know, public lands are, you know, generally large expanses of, you know, relatively undeveloped land where those natural ecosystems continue to function, you know, as they have. And so, yes, I mean, they're, they're critically important for, um, you know, threatened and endangered species, but also just non-game species, you know, species that we don't hunt and fish. All right. What is up, everybody? If you're listening to this right now, it is September. And I know you're listening to this right now because you anxiously await the dropping of every episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. So thank you for listening. Also, if you're listening right now, it's September, which Sawyer, I got Sawyer to my right, is Public Lands Month. Big month. Big month. Big month. Public Lands Month. And frankly, for me, for us, I think for a lot of folks, every month is Public Lands Month, but we celebrate it in September. So we're going to talk all about public lands here today. We have Joel Webster from the TRCP, or the, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, and uh, we're going to talk about public lands. So I'm going to, we'll give a, a little bit of a brief here. We're going to talk about, this is going to be a deep dive into our great public lands. Uh, we're going to talk about the TRCP. What is it? How do they interact with public lands related issues? Uh, how public lands are funded, who should care about public lands, uh, possibly some threats facing public lands, and uh, maybe some recent big wins and, and what's on the horizon. So that's kind of the, the framework of what, what we talk about today. So Joel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it off to you. So please, if you can, introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell us, you know, what is the TRCP? What are you guys up to? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark and, and Sawyer. Uh, it's great to be here. Really appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about public lands, especially at the start of September. I'm, I know millions of uh, hunters are thinking about these places and can't wait to get out and chase elk and deer and other critters. Um, so I'm the vice president of Western Conservation at the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. I've been with the organization um, for 14 years now, which is kind of crazy. Um, I grew up, I grew up out West. I grew up in a small town in Oregon. Um, and I've been hunting and fishing, you know, across the West since I was a boy when I went out with my dad. Um, and I got, you know, involved in this work, um, you know, really just sort of growing up in a small town and seeing it change and a lot of my favorite hunting spots being, uh, turned into subdivisions. And that's really sort of how I got involved in conservation. And, uh, um, but what I, what I focus on, you know, with TRCP is we've got, um, a team across the West and I'll just sort of back up and talk a little bit more about TRCP in general, you know, we're a national conservation organization with a mission to guarantee all Americans quality places to hunt and fish. And, and we're a partnership in that we really focus on trying to bring, um, the hunting and fishing communities together, um, around major issues that affect sportsmen and women. Um, cause if we're, you know, if we're all asking for different things, if we're all, if we're not talking, then um, it's really hard for decision makers to take us seriously. And so we're all about sort of maximizing the power of our community around conservation and access. And we work on, on six sort of primary areas. Um, the first public lands, you know, there's 640 million acres of public land in federal public lands um, in the United States. And that's primarily what our Western team works on because there's a you know predominant amount of public lands in the West. Um, so they work to make sure that those lands are, you know, conservative, there's access to them. We work on private lands, um, you know, private lands is obviously more of those than there is public and, um, they're super important. You know, you guys especially know this, I'm sure, you know, being located in the upper Midwest, like, you know, private lands are super important for, you know, whitetails, turkeys, you know, all sorts of upland birds. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, conservation programs out there that make sure that, Habitat on private land is good, you know, working on, on, on voluntary programs that work, you know, with landowners in a way that benefits landowners bottom line, but also benefits wildlife and the sporting public. We work on marine fisheries, uh, water, conservation funding, and making sure that there's money because this stuff takes money. And then also, most recently, we've been working on, on climate issues and really natural solutions for resilience and adaptation for fish and wildlife. And, uh, you know, we primarily work on federal policy. So, um, you know, things involved with the federal government, but we do also, like in the West, for example, we've got uh, field staff in eight states, it's about a dozen of us out in the West, and we've also got some field staff, a couple in the East, um, and we do engage in some real um, state issues that are sort of nationally important. So you're busy. 
<laughs> that, that's always a lot of busy. Stuff. Always lots going on. Um, lots of different things simmering. And, uh, and then all of a sudden something starts to happen, you know, because something aligns, right. Cause you know, politics, like nothing happens then all of a sudden it does. And so, um, we're working on things and when they start to move, we've got to be prepared to make sure that hunters and anglers have a seat at the table and that we're benefiting, um, from what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like I, I barely even know where to start when you're talking about all those things that you guys are working on. I mean, that is, uh, that's about as deep as it gets into, you know, access and habitat and, and you're touching all the major points there. What, like how, so you're talking about TRCP, like, uh, I guess interacting on at the federal level and things like that. So I think a big one too, would be kind of Joel talking about TRCP. You're talking about all of these big buckets kind of, you kind of alluded to it a little bit as TRCP is kind of this method for organizing and collaborating with other organizations. Like you look at your website and someone might go to that website and be, okay, TRCP, who do we work with? You got these other organizations. So do you guys kind of consider yourself kind of the shining light and like gathering of those groups to get everyone at the table? And then you're kind of the voice that takes everything to the top. Obviously those organizations have folks they work with that are on Capitol Hill. They're doing all these things. But do you guys kind of see your role as kind of the catalyst for all of those things and, and unifying that voice? Yeah, um, there's a lot in that question. I'll try and answer it as completely as I can. So, you know, we're our own entity, our own organization. We have our own staff um, and we're able to take our own positions. However, we've got 60 formal partners. So ranging from like the Boone and Crockett Club to you know, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and Trout Unlimited to the Mulder Foundation. Um, and we're really a coalition of, of the willing in that, um, you know, in each of these different bucket areas where we work, um, you know, certain groups are going to gravitate towards certain issues, right? So we might work on big game migration corridors. And on an issue like that, you're going to have organizations like the Mule Deer Foundation that are particularly interested in that issue. But the American Sport Fishing Association probably isn't. And so, um, you know, we have these different working groups that um, are comprised of different organizations that are interested in these issues. And then they collaborate um, around those issues to develop specific asks of policymakers. And what TRCP has is, um, you know, we have a lot of staff that really, you know, work with agencies. So the federal agencies like the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the U.S. Geological Survey, like, or, you know, agencies like that. Um, they also, we also work on the Hill and we have some lobbyists and we work to make sure that, um, so some of these groups, especially like single species organizations, they do a lot of like habitat work, right? They're pulling fences, they're putting in guzzlers, um, you know, they're removing juniper to, you know, benefit winter range. They're doing a lot of that work, but they maybe don't have, um, like the lobbyist presence. And so we really work to, to, to try and get everybody on common ground about like what the priorities are and what the asks are. But then we have staff who can go then work with those decision makers to make sure that that message is being carried to them. Um, you know, also at the state level, you know, we have field staff that, that work on the ground with like the state fish and wildlife agencies and with the governor's office and with the state sporting groups, as well as, you know, businesses in those states. Um, we have a number of corporate partners and we love, you know, working with Vortex. Obviously, you guys have been great on, on conservation issues. And so, um, when there are big things too, we work to get, make sure that those, you know, it's like, Hey, there's an opportunity here. Um, you know, let's say there's, you know, a proposal from the forest service to do something that, you know, do a lot of good stuff for, for access. And so, you know, how about we get some letters in, we make sure that people are reaching out to these folks, these decision makers. And so that way, when they come to make a decision, we're the squeaky wheel, right? And we're not being ignored because, um, as they say, right, if you're if you're not at the table, you're on the menu um, with these <laughs> policy decisions. And so we make sure that we're at the table. And I think that's a really good point. And I think the sport fishing example is a really good one. Like maybe they're they're obviously not laser focused on travel corridors, but I think in the broader scheme of things, creating um, an ecosystem for that collaboration between organizations is kind of the the sum of all of the parts. Whereas, like, I know we've signed on to, to a couple of letters that you guys have sent over, and it's like, okay, whether it's a, a brand in the private space that might be quote-unquote competitors, I think it's nice to have you guys as kind of that third party 
to be like, okay, guys, like let's all get it. Let's all get on the same page here. We all we all like these things. We all want to support these things, whether it's Vortex or another company. Your consumers enjoy these things. Where do we go from there that we can all sign on to the same letter or get behind the same cause? And just speaking frankly, if, if you guys weren't there, I don't think that would happen. Yeah, and I we really appreciate you know different companies being willing to sign on to letters with their competitors. Um, but ultimately, right, if we if we don't have places to hunt, we don't have places to shoot. There's not customers out there. At least there's a lot fewer customers, mm-hmm. and so everybody benefits. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you may share the marketplace or compete with that company, but uh, which is great. It makes the companies better, you know, through that competition. But at the base level, you know, we care. We all care about the same things, mm-hmm. you know. And I think when you find that commonality there, um, you get a much, much more stronger, much unified voice. And yeah, the work you guys do of bringing yeah, everybody together on that is uh, is pretty amazing. What is that? Is that a pretty common thread? Is is the access in public lands like a um, a really common thread, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, Mule Deer Foundation or, or the Elk Foundation or, you know, a sport fishing org, is the access in public lands something that all those or most of those um, groups share? Is there co- commonality there? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of groups that, um, you know, care about public lands. I mean, some are maybe less active in the day-to-day collaboration, but when it comes time to like add their name to a cause, they're, you know, they're willing to be a good partner and, and, and do the right thing. Um, for, for, you know, some of the saltwater focused like fishing organizations, right. I mean, they're more concerned about the Gulf and, um, and mangroves and, and the Everglades than they are about, um, you know, fishing out West, but, um, or in, on public lands, you know, where I, uh, you know, where I'm focused, but, they oftentimes will, you know, sign on to letters when there's sort of larger causes or, or you know, put their name behind um, those asks, knowing that they're important for the community as a whole. Mm-hmm. It depends, though. I mean, some organizations um, are very narrowly focused and they're they're very reserved on, um, you know, what they do and do not um, put their name behind. And other ones uh, are, are much more willing to to sort of put their support behind a whole broad suite of things that the community wants. It's really it's a strategic approach and um you know that's that's up to them um based on their priorities Mm -hmm. so kind of talking about how you guys are are structured joel and the resources that you guys have and all the horsepower that you put behind these things how is trcp funded yeah um we have a variety of different funding sources um you know we we receive money from corporate partners um such as vortex and other brands that we work with you know through our dinner and as well as working cooperatively with them on projects. Um, we have grant funding for specific projects, but we'll receive grants to, um, or we'll actually have a thing that we wanna do and we'll figure out, you know, are there you know, funders out there that um, are willing to support that work? And so we'll develop, you know, submit proposals. And then we also um, you know, receive quite a bit of our funding through individuals that believe in us and our mission. And so those are really the three primary ways that we receive funding. We do. Um, we actually did get a, a Pittman Robertson, um, grant this last year too, on, um, on, uh, R3 activities for recruitment, retention and reactivation activities with, mm-hmm. with, with owners. So, um, as well. So yeah, but that, those are the primary ways that we get our funding. And I think that's a really good segue to like talking about federal versus state. You got BLM, you've got state agencies, you've got USGS, you've got all these things operating out there. And I think the the thing you hear a lot of times, whether it's guys in guys or gals in Wisconsin with a wildlife area right next to their house where they hunt whitetails, or the guy out west that's chasing antelope and has his favorite spot, I think a lot of what you hear is they're thinking smaller scale. They want projects right by them. They want to actually see the results. And I think sometimes you miss the forest for the trees on that. So. How do you guys kind of communicate that to folks? Whereas the work that you do, whether it's lobbying or kind of this high level stuff, um, how do you explain that to folks that, that want to see results right by them? Uh, how do you explain kind of the broader goals of everything and how it kind of helps everyone versus looking at it more 
by that property by property approach? I mean, I think the property by property approach is certainly important. And that really comes down to making sure people are involved locally. You know, really what we're involved in is growing the pie. And so there's more opportunity for those local projects to take place. Um, you know, for example, making sure that the land and water conservation fund, which I know we're going to talk about some more later, um, you know, that, that this program that's used to help support federal acquisition of lands, that it's got as much money as possible, right, that it's fully funded. And so that way there's more money to go around. And so all the worthy projects out there can get funded. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that's really, you know, what we focus on. And, and, and we've you know, we really try and, and localize our work by, you know, identifying examples of, you know, how this funding is being used that does put it in people's backyards. But um, we're really trying to create this framework um, that creates, you know, pots of money or make sure that the program works in a way that like if it is being used to acquire land or if the, the sort of any sort of acquisitions are being done. Um, that there's an access component or if there's restoration work, that's going to have the greatest benefit for game species, right? Not just like threatened and endangered species, but that, you know, things like deer and, and, and other species that we care about are, are getting, you know, a, a piece of that um, action. And so, but that's really what we focus on is trying to make sure that the framework set up that benefits our community and that the pie of dollars, um, if we're talking about dollars and acquisitions and things like that, that that's as big as possible. And so those local projects get funded. I think that's a really great explanation of how how everything kind of shakes out because I think rather than looking at it as, well, uh, Goose Lake Wildlife Area right by me, uh, a team was out there picking up trash, um, cutting invasives, things like that. I think for a lot of people it kind of starts and ends there, and those people on the ground are such a crucial part of that. But that project was funded by X organization and the – it, it was initially pitched by X organization above them. And then the money came from X organization organization above them. So it's kind of like this trickle down that I don't know how familiar people are with kind of how that works. Yeah. I would imagine most folks aren't. And one thing too, that is we really like is that some of our partners are doing a lot of that implementation work, right? Like pheasants forever, for example. I mean, I know that they've got a lot of people on the ground, especially, especially in the Midwest. Um, And they're doing awesome work in terms of working with the state agencies and and setting up some of these smaller acquisitions or these restoration projects. Um, And and that stuff's really powerful. And so having, you know, we we can, TRCP can play a major role in helping to set up that framework, but then having partners that are doing a lot of that great implementation work, it it, it all fits together and and everybody's needed because if you um, if you aren't involved in every step of the process and there's going to be somebody else in the room trying to take, you know, take advantage of the situation. So it benefits them. And that's why the, the hunting community needs to be involved at all levels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, you're talking about that impl- implementation level, which is number one. I mean, it's super important because people can see it. You know, you can, it is you, you, and you can get involved. Right. I think a lot of people want to get involved. And it's like, how do I get involved? And I think sometimes the where you guys spend a lot of your time and effort is a very ominous like just this uh i don't know nebulous like thing that's that's hard to grasp in a way you know i think a lot of including myself i'm not familiar with um how the uh the 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 political arena works you know or lobbying things like that but i can pick up a shovel Mm -hmm. you know and and do some work and i think sort of the way you describe that to me like i picture it being like you know you guys are kind of like working on the reservoir, right? Like if you picture like a, a water reservoir and then the river that comes out of that touching all those different points along the way and mm-hmm. and um and all those points are, are super important. But it does start with the reservoir. And I, I think we'll probably chat on it later with some of these kind of larger projects, but I think the other big thing is it's in the hunting community as a whole, I think to your point, Joel, of of getting everyone on the same page, I think you just have such a, a difference in how people think of these things. If You've got one guy who, if I donate twenty dollars to an organization, I want to see it in my backyard. I want to see shovels on the ground. I want to, I want to see the result of where my money's going. And then, I mean, I'll use me as an example. If I donate twenty dollars to an organization and I find out it went to a travel corridor in Utah, great. Like, there's not a right or a wrong opinion there, but there's just such a difference in how people want to see it implemented that I think that creates a big divide in kind of how people see conservation as a whole. 
you know, our work does touch down um, to the ground in the local level, though, but it's really about federal land management. Um, I mean, also, there's some local stuff we're doing on our other programs, but I'm less familiar with it. But in, on the federal side, you know, one of the things we do, too, in addition to being engaged in these larger national policies to make sure that the guidance coming down um, benefits the interests of hunters and anglers, we're also involved in, like, for example, a Bureau of Land Management land use plan or a national forest plan or a fish and wildlife service hunt fish expansion like there's been a lot of um rules that have moved forward that actually expand hunting and hunting and fishing opportunities on national wildlife refuges and so we're making sure that that stuff happens um and so there's there's like these different levels of engagement but you know you've got let's say the lolo national forest in montana um, you know, or like the Four Rivers BLM area in, in, in Idaho, which is like the Bennett Hills, Unit 45 and all that great mule deer country down there. Um, you know, we're involved in those land use plans to make sure that the management on the ground is done in a way that they're conserving like winter range and, and migratory routes that, um, you know, management objectives are, are focused on things like habitat restoration. And so that way, when you've got the local group that wants to do the project, the plan actually directs the agency to prioritize that stuff. And so they're not working on something else that doesn't benefit us. And so like, again, um, I think your, your reservoir example is, is great, Mark, but we're really trying to set that stuff up. And, or if it's in Nevada, you know, making sure that a, a sheep group can put in a guzzler, right. We're trying to make sure that that, um, that plan allows for that. And so you've got that, that restoration and, and enhancement work that is prioritized but at the same time, we're trying to, you know, prevent developments that might fragment that habitat and, and make it less valuable for wildlife, which is important for, you know, also su for supporting wildlife abundance. And, you know, the more animals you have in the landscape, then the more tags the state agency can issue, which results in more hunter opportunity for all of us, which we all know that it's getting harder and harder to get tags. And so the way to have more tags is to have more critters. <laughs> And, and, and we, you know, the work that we're doing on public lands is really designed on, on trying to maximize wildlife populations through the habitat lens, but also making lands accessible. Um, you know, there's a lot of lands that are hard to get to uh, because the, like a public road doesn't touch them. And so you've either got a big block of land where you've got, a, you can only access it from one side and the other side's pretty inaccessible because you just can't get there. Or you've actually got parcels that are entirely landlocked and the only way you can get there is by knocking on some private landowner's door and and hope hope that they'll be willing to, to grant you permission which um it's possible it takes quite a bit of work but some you know some landowners won't allow that and, and so you're really rolling the dice right yeah you know what so i've got two questions here maybe i'll circle back to this other one but um you're, you know you're talking about you know public lands do you know how many like i guess maybe from like an aggregate perspective like how many acres of public lands do we have in the united states do i mean do we have a tally on that yeah federally there's 600 about 640 million acres of federal public lands and that's you know national forests that's bureau of land management that's national wildlife refuge national parks plus there's some other you know like army corps and, and bureau of reclamation lands like around reservoirs which are actually can be pretty dang good for things like waterfowl hunting and stuff like that um, and so there's 640 million acres of federal lands. There's also, you know, tens of millions of acres. I'm not exactly sure to the total tally of state lands. Um, and there's all different sorts of state lands. I mean, there's like, you know, the classic wildlife management area that we all know and love that, you know, is, is administered by a state wildlife agency. And so those lands are specifically managed for the purpose of conserving, um, and producing wildlife. Um, but there's other state lands. There's state trust lands, which are lands that are administered to um, actually support a beneficiary like a school um, or a university. And, and those lands are managed to generate revenue. Um, however, most states allow hunting and fishing on state trust lands. And there's generally some sort of an agreement with the state wildlife agency where like you spend 10 bucks or whatever on your hunting license. And then that money goes to that state trust land institution actually pay for those, you know, benefit those schools. And that's how you have access. It's a nominal fee. Most people don't know about it, but that's actually how they're managed. But a lot of state trust lands are quite good. And I know they're in your country as well. You're part of the world and in Wisconsin. Um, and then you know, there's other types of state lands, like whether it's, you know, the department of transportation along a roadway um, or old lands that were forfeited, you know, 
people quit paying taxes on them at the you know end of the you know 1800s or early 1900s um, after they you know sort of whether like old timber lands or whatever they'd cut over and then walked away from and then those lands actually went to the counties um, some of those have become like state forests where you know now they're managed um, as forests but you know those types of lands too can be you know pretty important I mean even those Department of Transportation lands are oftentimes open for hunting and so it's worth doing your homework um, if you're in a place that doesn't have a lot of public land or you're just trying to work harder than the next guy, um, you know, and all the obvious spots are full of people, but you're looking for those spots that maybe people are overlooking, like look and, you know, see what kind of lands are out there. Are there some county lands? Reach out to that county if there are, you know, inquire about whether or not they're open to hunting. And, and that's a great way to um, expand your hunting opportunities is by by doing your research on that step. But there's a whole whole bunch of different kinds of state lands, um, a lot of which are, are open to hunting mm-hmm. and fishing. Mm-hmm. State, state parks too. For sure, for sure. My next question was, you know, we're talking about, you know, habitat. And I think as hunters and anglers, we think oftentimes in the context of, you know, fish and game species that, that we enjoy pursuing. But what's the, um, I would have to assume that there's a lot of benefits to non-game species as well. So, like, if you're not a hunter or an angler, uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, an organization like you that may, you know, focus heavily in the, in the on those, on issues related to that, isn't helping maybe those threatened or endangered species at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like people like deer and elk, and uh, but oftentimes when you're conserving deer and elk habitat, you're also conserving habitat for other wildlife. You know, whether it's a grizzly bear or, you know, or, or a songbird and, uh, um, you know, public lands are, you know, generally large expanses of, you know, relatively undeveloped land where those natural ecosystems continue to function, you know, as they have. And so, yes, I mean, they're, they're critically important for, um, you know, threatened and endangered species, but also just non-game species, you know, species that we don't hunt and fish, but I, you know, doing good things for, um, you know, game species generally, you know, provides a lot of additional benefits, you know, to non-game species. And, you know, I, I oftentimes listen to, um, I, I shouldn't say oftentimes, but I enjoy listening to, to Howard Vincent, the president and CEO of Pheasants Forever. I always talk about pollinators and how, you know, by, you know, conserving pheasant habitat, they're actually benefiting, you know, pollinators, which are obviously critically important in terms of, you know, food and, and having crops. And so, um, you know, the work that, that, that hunters do and, and anglers do in conserving uh, fish and wildlife habitat has a, has a ton of benefits. You know, also public lands, um, you know, are really important for like clean water, like drinking water. I mean, not only are we, you know, pulling trout out of streams or, or bass or whatever, but, um, you know, oftentimes the headwaters of those streams come out of mountains where it's generally the water's clean. And, um, you know, if you rely on clean drinking water, which we all do, um, those places are critically important for that, as well as, you know, clean air and um, and just recreation, uh, being able to get outside. You know, if, even if folks who don't shoot or hunt or fish, um, be able to go camping or, or ride your bike, um, do things like that with the family. Uh, obviously that's just a healthy thing to do. And we've seen a lot of people turn to those activities, um, you know, during the COVID pandemic, it's kind of crazy just to, to see the increases in, um, in traffic on public lands, places I used to go where you didn't see many people are definitely a lot more crowded, but that's just people getting out because, um, you know, that's how you maintain your sanity. It's pretty nice. Yeah. I think that is the cool thing though. Like, that doesn't seems like it doesn't get talked about a lot is a lot of the game species that we like to chase are those umbrella species. So when you're managing for that species, like everything below it benefits, whereas it's really tough to manage up and manage for like one bird species. Like there might be one type of flora or something that they really like, but I can almost guarantee that a deer is probably going to eat that too. So if you can manage down from those game species, with something that tons of consumers and members of the public can get behind that person that is really into Kirtland warblers, you know, but may not have any idea what white tails of Wisconsin is, you know, like they're going to benefit from that. So I think it's finding creative ways to communicate that. I don't think we've cracked that code quite yet, but I think it's a discussion that they'd be open to. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, and I think that's a really, really good point. So you look at, like you said, those umbrella species, or you know, I don't know, diving back into like, the, you know, the ocean. Like, if you have great whites and orca whales, chances are a lot of other things are doing okay as well. Mm-hmm. I think, even though I, I do have a bona fide fear of of great whites. By the way, yeah, that's just yep. that's just a little fun fact there. Also, I mean, you go to conservative areas of the West, you know animals like deer, like mule deer are pretty dang popular. I mean, everybody likes them. And, uh, and so it's also a way to build popular support for conservation around, you know, animals that, um, you know, are tied to the culture of a place, right. You live in a place where the, the sort of having deer around is something that everybody values. And so, you know, focusing conservation efforts on those are, it's pretty easy, right. Versus some of these endangered species, some of them are controversial, um, you know, some of them people, you know, like a, a snail darter or, or an insect, like people generally don't have, um, maybe don't care as much about those species because they don't see them or, or don't, you know, view them as, as important. And so doing conservation around, um, you know, animals like deer and elk and bighorn sheep, um, in a way that can conserve other species is also, it's a great way to sort of get social support for conservation too, mm-hmm. um, because people love those 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 species of wildlife i mean they they love them they understand them they interact with them like you said it's an important part of their life their culture um like getting like you said getting that popular support and that buy-in i mean that does seem like uh you know probably is it it, the best starting point now i will say i am very connected joel to the snail darter that you mentioned uh (laughs) big uh, snail guy big snail guy you know but you know what i say that i'm like kind of joking but I do care about. I very much care about that snail. I don't know anything about it, but if it's a if it's a you know important part of a intact landscape, that's that's probably a good thing. I, I think it's actually a fish. Let me just look. I, that I, up I did hear sure darter at the end. I was oh. like, man, I think we're speaking out of turn here. We yeah, need to get up on our on our fish. It is a fish. <sighs> it, it, maybe he oh. maybe it eats snails. Color me embarrassed. Next that uh, must be it. next ten minute talk. The snail darter. Everything <laughs> <laughs> everything I need to know. You might need a full length on that one. Yeah, it probably, it probably the uh, in the name itself, like you said, darter. You know, implies you know fish, but also uh, just the name itself. Like I don't uh, picture a snail darting too much. No, I I was actually I think misleading because I almost went to like some endangered snail, but then I changed it to snail darter. So I think maybe I paused a little bit too long and led you down that path. So I'll take responsibility for that. I tell Good. you, I tell you, Good. What. it's not our fault. Okay, perfect. <laughs> that. That, that is all I care about. It's not my fault. And I'll tell you what, here's, here's uh, in the plus one category, I'm extremely curious about the snail darter, and I probably actually will look that up and learn a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Half your day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, Joel, I think you touched on something, too, when you were talking about during COVID and everything else going on during that. Like, I don't want to date this podcast. I know, and in right? 10 years, people are like, huh? Yeah. I actually will probably never forget. But... Um, have you guys seen over the past year, year and a half with more people, I mean, we've seen more people buy guns, we've seen more people get into hunting, we've seen um, sales for things like backpacks, camelbacks, all of that stuff increase. What have you guys seen at TRCP? Has it kind of bubbled up from the bottom and you guys have seen more support uh, and more kind of praise coming in for all these wild places that people are experiencing or has it been... Not not that way, I guess. I feel like the industry as a whole is doing really well right now. Um, and we're benefiting from that as well through some of our donors who are doing well. Um, plus also our work, just in terms of our focus of our work, has been affected by it. When, um, you know, you have increased pressure on public lands, um, people experiencing crowding, Um, you know, that comes up in discussion about having to address those things. Um, And so just some of our work, um, A, and, you know, providing new opportunities for access that help like disperse crowds, um, but also just sort of, you know, considering concerns and and questions about, um, you know, overcrowding and and how to address it. Um, You know, I do know that um, also like state agencies, um, like their license funding seems to be up. There's an increase in, um, like fishing and, and hunting license sales in general, it seems like, but also I know in a lot of states that do, um, 
you have hunting applications like a point system and like especially the western states their applications are way up and uh you know i'm not sure if that's like more people up there's more people hunting. Um, and so therefore there are more people applying or if there's more people are sort of jumping into the non-resident application game. Mm-hmm. But I do know that like state budgets seem to be doing really well. Um, which is, you know, just a few years ago, you know, a lot of the states were really hurting, um, in terms of being short on resources and having to cut things. And so it's great to see them, you know, with a ton of money, uh, at least in the short term. Also, you know, Pittman Robertson, um, Dingle Johnson funding is, is up. Um, I can just dive into those if you like. Um, so basically there's a couple of, there's excise taxes on, on, on firearms, ammunition, um, archery equipment. That's the, um, Pittman Robertson funding source. And then that's a, actually an excise tax. It's 11%. It was created in 1937. And then there's Dingle Johnson, which was created in 1950, which provide, creates a similar tax for, um, fishing equipment. And it's, um, 10 percent plus there's some other fishing taxes tied to things like boat fuel and, mm-hmm. and trolling motors and fish finders and things like that um, but those dollars so um you know consumers when you buy a product you're paying that excise tax and then that money goes into um basically that money is then redistributed to the states by the u.s fish and wildlife service um through the wildlife and sport fish restoration fund. And, um, and so, you know, all the States received funding through those excise taxes. And in 2021, they did given out over a billion dollars, um, to the States, which is, I think a hundred and about 120 million more than 2020. And I, I believe it's an all time high. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, pretty incredible amount of money. And, and that money is used, um, for a whole bunch of things. It's used for, you know, building shooting ranges. It's, it's, it's for, uh, you know, purchasing wildlife management areas at the state level and, and doing habitat restoration, conservation easements, as well as, you know, recruitment, retention, and reactivation of, of new hunters and anglers. And so, um, you know, through this pandemic, through this increase in, um, you know, people wanting to get outside and, and people wanting to shoot, um, there's just a bunch of money right now. And, uh, and that's, you know, I think absolutely fantastic for, you know, our sports because, you know, having that investment is going to create better habitat. It's going to create more facilities for folks to, you know, go shoot um, and, and hopefully, you know, lead to more sort of opportunities for people to, to get outside. I think you're going to see a lot of backlogged products or projects get done this year that were uh, on the back burner for a number of years, which is super cool. I mean, yeah, that that is absolutely super cool. You know, it's it's interesting. I look at that that uptick in participation as somewhat somewhat of a double edged sword in some ways, right? Because uh, you've got. Uh, I feel like in a lot of ways you don't get people to care about these wild places or these public lands or related issues if they're not participating. I think that's the best way for somebody to you know, become intertwined with these places and want to care about them. On the flip side, you have an uptick in participation, which is a strain or could be potentially a strain on these finite resources, as well as, you know, I think oftentimes we're seeking solitude, right? When we're trying to go to these wild places. So then you're, you're losing some of that component. So I see like so many benefits and positives, but also some challenges at the same time. Mm-hmm. But hopefully that increase in funding, right, can help address some of those challenges. I fully understand that and appreciate that personally. I mean, as somebody who likes to get out and, and hunt as much as I possibly can um, with sort of the work and family balance, uh, you know, I, I don't like seeing other people, you know, where I like to go hunt. I like to have those places to myself because it gives you the advantage, right. In hunting situations. However, um, you know, I sort of taking a step back from me, I do think if you care about the future of hunting too, right. And care about the future of of shooting, um, or even gun ownership in this country. Um, I mean, look at the the sort of overall population in the United States, right? It's continuing to grow pretty rapidly. But how many Americans are there? Like 320 million or something like that. Um, 
you know, if we don't continue to sort of maintain our numbers or potentially grow our numbers and also, you know, potentially we need to diversify as a community too. And so that way, you know, we, you know, are, are sort of more represented across America because it's going to maintain our, our relevance as a community in the long term. And if we just, um, you know, want to sort of keep people out and, and sort of have these places to ourselves where there's actually fewer of us, well, it might be nice in the short term, um, and that we have some places to ourselves. I think it actually creates sort of longer term threats mm-hmm. to the future of, of hunting and, and, and shooting. And so um, it's really in our best interest, I think, to, you know, to, to recruit new folks and recruit different folks to, to engage in these activities because um, we're all bonded by, you know, enjoying hunting and enjoying the outdoors and and having more people, I think, in that tent is ultimately going to help ensure the, the future of these activities in the long term future. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Nope. Could, could not have said it better. Nope. Nope. For sure. Yeah. The pros of all that definitely outweigh the cons from uh, from a long term approach. No doubt about that. Um, I, I also think technology has made it harder to get away from people. Right. You used to have to work pretty hard to um, figure out the landscape, and now with you know satellite imagery at your, your fingertips, plus you know mapping applications at your fingertips that really daylight everything um it just requires more work than it used to to escape people i think it can still be done but you've got to be creative yeah you know you touched on a little bit earlier too like you know um you know limited big game applications are up and it's you know tougher to draw a tag that maybe you used to draw every year like oh my gosh you know i I could count on yeah it's a draw but like it might as well be a tc like i'm i'm gonna get this tag every year and that's becoming more difficult and i think there's a variety of factors at play. It's like, yeah, okay, there's an uptick in participation. So maybe we have some new hunters. Maybe some people are being reactivated that I haven't hunted in a few years, but you know, I'm going to get back into it. So maybe that person is applying, but also the access to, like you said, uh, the mapping programs, which I'd use basically daily, either, you know, I'm, you know, couch scouting or in the field. And then the information on these applications, which used to be just this Pandora's box of, you know, oh, I have to email the state of whatever because I want them to send me their their app, their uh, their their big game regulations so I can sort out the draw system. But then I can't even, you know, then getting back to the mapping, well, how do I scout that area? I don't know. You know I'm not going to be able to. So all these things collectively are making it way more accessible to go, you know, put in and be confident that you're going to have like a fun, positive, not frustrating experience in these kind of far away states. So... I know, pretty long explanation there, but I think, uh, but my point, you know, I think there's a variety of factors at play here kind of coming to a point, you know, at this point in time. But I think it just speaks to the importance of organizations like TRCP and Mm -hmm. and all those other places to ensure that they're working on the back end to, if those numbers do continue to climb, we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to make sure there's enough space for everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a a good challenge, a good good problem to have, you know? Yep, great problem to have you know speaking of places to go like in some ways it's like okay you know here hey they're not making any more land but are there ways to and i don't want to diminish the importance of private land because i think private land and private land ownership is extremely important for everybody and again for just a variety of factors but are there ways to create more public land or more access that you guys are exploring or people should be thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, there's a few different ways. I mean, first off, we should be able to get to the lands that we already own. And I imagine you're familiar with the work that TRCP has done with Onyx, you know, starting in 2018. Um, and then over the last two years, we've expanded it where we worked together to identify the total acreage of landlocked public lands across 22 states. Um, In the West, Midwest, and in the Mid-Atlantic and South, we've looked at 22 states and have found 16.43 million acres of state and federal land um, that are inaccessible unless you have permission from an adjacent private landowner. And so, um, you know, looking at opportunities to um, make those lands accessible is, is hugely important. And, you know, obviously a, a real easy sort of clear way to do that is to, you know, for 
the state and federal agencies to purchase either parcels or easements that connect those pieces to roads. Um, and so the public can get to them. But, um, you know, 16 million acres is like eight Yellowstone National Parks. I mean, that's a ton of hunting and fishing country that you can't get to. And, um, and that's something that we're actively working on. Um, you know, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is a federal program that has been around since 1964. But what it does is it uses um, offshore oil and gas or so development in like the Gulf of Mexico, um, you know, receipts from that, um, that sort of the royalties that go back to the, the federal government, those dollars are then sort of reallocated toward, um, you know, this land and water conservation fund program, which uh, 40% of that has to be used um, on the federal side for actually acquiring lands or interest in land like easements. 40% of it goes to states and then another 20% um, kind of floats around and is used for different purposes. But anyway, that's like the most powerful program we have in terms of acquiring land. Um, but also there's a piece of it, 3% at a minimum of the 900 million which is $27 million, but also potentially more, must be used every year to um, establish or expand access where on, on, on public land. So basically where it either areas are difficult to access or where they're inaccessible. And so like the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, they have those dollars at their fingertips where they have to be used to expand access. And so it's a great tool where, um, you know, in cooperation, you know, with, with private landowners through voluntary agreements, right, not coercing anybody to do anything, um, you know, land trusts like the Elk Foundation or, or other, you know, land trusts can, or that the agencies themselves can work out of these agreements with these landowners and then, um, and then they can do a purchase and so then sort of making those lands accessible. That's a big part of it. But also, you know, LWCF can be used to acquire lands as well and sort of turn private lands into public lands. Um, you know, I think for places that have super fish and wildlife and recreation values, I mean, that's a, a great approach as well, um, where you might have a place that's just, you know, some of the most gorgeous elk country you've ever seen. It really, you know, it's up against existing federal land. And so it makes sense or it's an inholding. It just makes sense to be a part of the public estate. Um, so that's clearly a, a great way to do it. You know, on the state side, um, you know, I think wildlife management areas, state forests, those you know types of approaches can be fantastic in terms of if you've got really important places where an acquisition can, again, make sense. We've got great fish and wildlife values. Do it. Um, there's also other things, though, like, like state walk-in access programs, which, you know, as you pointed out, Mark, like private lands are super important, um, you know, for public access. And, and they've got, you know, state agencies oftentimes have these state walk-in access programs where through licensed dollars or other funding, um, they're then, you know, compensating landowners to make their land available to the public. But oftentimes, um, you know, these walk-in access programs can also be used to make inaccessible public lands accessible where you have maybe got 10,000 acres of landlocked public land behind a ranch. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if that private land could then be enrolled in some sort of a, a walk-in access program like block management in Montana, then you're not only, you know, making those private lands accessible to the public for, for hunting, but you're also making those adjacent public lands accessible. So that's another way to do it that can be pretty effective, especially in places where maybe, you know, it doesn't, there's, there's certain smaller chunks of BL, of like public land that it's like, well, you're never really going to like buy your way to that smaller parcel, right? Maybe it's like 400 acres, like in and of itself, it wouldn't make sense to buy 5,000 acres to make 400 accessible. But if you did a, a lease with that landowner to make that private land um, accessible, then those smaller chunks, um, you know, are like an added bonus that comes as a part of that. Mm hmm yeah, you see that a lot, you know, I'll go on, you know, Onyx or, you know, whatever, you know, your, your digital mapping software is and you'll see like, you know, that walk in chunk and then it connects to, a, you know, a piece of state, a, a you know, a piece of BLM kind of making it this, you know, contiguous uh, piece of land that, that you can access that's super, I mean, what a great resource, right? And I think the cool thing with those programs is, again, like private lands and private landowners and just the ability to own land, extremely important. But that's a way, like I look at that, I'm like, man, that's such a big win for everybody. 
I agree. And I personally, as a hunter, when I look at a block management area, like in Montana or, you know, access, yes. And Idaho or whatever, um, it's those parcels that have adjacent public lands that you otherwise can't get to that I'm almost most interested in oftentimes because that's where you can get away from the roads. And, uh, like sometimes those, those public parcels can take you like three miles in or four miles in. And, um, you know, once you start getting a mile, mile and a half away from a road, that's when you really start to lose everybody else. And so those little pockets of those sort of back, those dead end public land parcels where you, you the only way to get in there is to walk to the back and then walk back out. Um, you know, oftentimes you can hunt country that doesn't get a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Those pieces are <laughs> in the back corner somewhere. Yeah. You just got to keep an eye on the property boundaries. Yeah. Yep. 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 Which that, again, that does uh, the benefit of, of, of quality, you know, digital mapping software can't be, uh, can't be overstated there. I mean, you know, it's a gr- great tool for getting in and out and, you know, being cognizant of those boundaries as you, you know, traverse the landscape. Well, in the VPA stuff in Wisconsin, too, the signage is, uh, let me say, clear. <laughs> <laughs> that you are uh, on the line, and you should not cross said line at risk of harm potentially. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just amazed that some people don't use you know those GPS apps still because those in and of themselves made millions of acres of accessible but really unusable lands available. I mean, when you think about you know, oftentimes those public strips are pretty narrow and there's no fencing. Um, if you don't have an app, like you really can't like navigate right. those properties and know you're staying on public. And you know, I remember like hunting antelope and stuff back before, like, you know, those SD cards are made available for like Garmin GPS units. When you're just looking at your little arrow on the screen and like, I would avoid a lot of those parcels. I go check them out. You know, be looking at my my odometer on my speedometer, like there'd be like a corner, right? And I'd count it on the paper map. And so I'd drive the two and a half miles to where that little strip of BLM was. And if there wasn't like a fence there or something that would delineate where the edge of that boundary was, I'd just keep going because right. you couldn't tell. So, I mean, it's really made a lot of land available. So that's like millions of acres in and of itself. And then you've got these places that all of a sudden you, you, you've realized you're there, but you can't get to. And and that's really, I think, the next step in a lot of this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just the the visibility on that these places that you, the ones you can get to exist is, you know, unbelievably handy and important. And I think it's yeah. gives, it's given people the, um, I don't know, just like the level of confidence you can have, you know, heading out or going going further and, you know, being confident that, number one, you're going to stay on the public land. Uh, and then number two, you're going to be able to get back to your vehicle, uh, is, uh, I mean, very, very liberating, very freeing. Puts me at ease. Yeah. (laughs) I think that's safe (laughs) to say. (laughs) Oh man. Sawyer, what's, what's next, what's next on our question docket? There's a, well, I'm just going to say there's one more thing I wanted to point out, um, on the access front, if if you don't mind, It, it has to do with easements, um, access easements. And so oftentimes the way you get to public land are on these rights of way, what they're called, or easements, like the Forest Service or the BLM, or even like a state agency will own own a right to cross that land. Um, And uh, and that's where they'll put roads. But often sometimes there's nothing there, but they still own that right. And one thing that we've discovered through this work is that um, like the Forest Service and the BLM, they have tens of thousands of these easements that they own that are actually access rights that are open to the public, but they're still held on in, in paper files and in, in filing cabinets at local agency offices. And so unless you actually go and manually pull those easements and study them, you cannot learn where access exists in certain places and where it, it doesn't. And so one of the things that we're working on is there's a bill called the Modernizing Access to Our Public Land Act that would direct the federal agencies and provide funding to them um, to take these paper files, which is about 50,000 of them that we know of, um, that are not digitized and actually upload them in the digital files and then make them publicly available. And so when you 
look at a map, you could click on that route and it'd tell you if it's a public route, if they have an easement or if they don't. And right now, like it's kind of crazy that even the agencies don't know in some places where they do and do not have access, let mm-hmm. alone us, the public. And uh, and so that's something that we're hoping this bill will get passed by the end of the year. It would also do some other things um, that really is focused on trying to um, a lot of the geospatial information that the agencies create. So like the, the thing that ends up being the features on your app. Um, like for like recreation for like roads and trails, for example, like they're not designed around access and recreation. And so they're kind of unusable. And so what we want to see it too, is so all public routes, like that, it tells you when they're open, if they're open or closed to what vehicle type they're open. So if you can drive your four wheeler on it, your mountain bike, or if it's like a foot or a horse trail only that all those features are on there. And so when you're driving on a BLM two track and you come to a fork in the road, you can click on that and it'll be like, this route is open to these vehicle types this time of year. And that way, if it's closed, you know, um, and you don't break the law, but if it's open, you also know you can go down it, um, which I think, you know, would be great in terms of helping people find new places to go. But also if you're trying to get away from folks, it'll help you figure out like where there's non-motorized areas as well. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, So the full name of that bill seems like it makes a a pretty pretty appropriate acronym then the the map land act that's right okay gotcha what and so you're saying you're hoping to get that passed by the end of the year like so what types of things are you guys doing to help push something like that through and if a person was interested how could they help with that yeah appreciate the question and so we're working with the actual congressional offices in both the house and the senate uh, um that have introduced and support the bill. So the bill um, in the the Senate, uh, I think has, there's 11 co-sponsors. Um, it was introduced by, by Senator Risch from Idaho. It's bipartisan support. It's had a hearing um, in the House. It has like nine co-sponsors, bipartisan support. Um, and, and, and that bill actually has had a, a markup um, and Blake Moore, a, a congressman from, from Utah, introduced that. And, uh, and so what we want to see happen is we want to see the House pass that bill this fall um, and then have the Senate you know, do a markup and then pass it as well. But obviously, they've got a lot going on right now. Um, you know, there's, there's a, you see in the news all the, the talk about this reconciliation package, but we're hopeful that once that is over, this can move right afterward. But it's got complete bipartisan support. And um, the way for, for folks to learn about this, you can go to TRCP's website at trcp.org um, or just Google the Mapland Act. TRCP might be the quickest way to actually get to the page. Um, we've got a breakdown on what it does and, and an action alert too that you can click through and, and send an email to your decision makers um on, on on what you know on, on asking them to to urge swift action on this bill but i think in terms of like sportsman's legislation like a proposal out there that's access focused um that's in front of us like this is like the most important thing at the moment that um you know public land hunters and anglers and shooters um can weigh in on in terms of making sure that um you have expanded opportunities and expanded access access and also just clear um information about where you can and cannot go and what kind of activities you can you know participate in certain places do they have a ballpark joel on on if we're lucky enough to get that passed how long implementation would take or maybe how that would be prioritized is there are they working on that list now or is that kind of a wait and see approach yeah, there's a four-year timeline. So once the bill passes, it provides funding and, and, and direction for the agencies to get all this done in four years. The Forest Service, I think right now, has 27,000 easements. And at their current rate of digitizing them, it'll be 20 years before they're in digital file. And I mean, I just cannot imagine in today's world, that should be 2040, but before they actually have their easements digitized on maps. And um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, a 1990s and 1980s way of doing business where you've got to pull this stuff manually out of a filing cabinet. And it's resulting in lost opportunities of field, but also just inefficiencies when you've got to do that. And so 
Um, four years is what the bill would require. And just the nature of some of those easements, some of them are in perpetuity, some of them are x number of years like they could digitize it and by the time they do that it's not <laughs> classic government classic government you know just just classic most of those are permanent perfect that is good but news. some of them are you know they're like 70 years old right like and they're they're long some of them are long forgotten yep um but it's a permanent right that has been purchased from a landowner i mean it is an undisputable right to access nobody's going to question it and Unless you go into a Forest Service office or you go down to the county recorder and you're like, I want to pull the, you know, the, the title information for this piece of property and look to see if there's an, an easement for a, a property, like you're just not going to find this. Right. So. Wild. That Huge it, implications, though. There is. I mean, I mean, in some ways I could see, well, and maybe they're just, it just is what it is, but like, is, is there any resistance to that? information being made public not really because it's all settled it can't be disputed yeah you know there's another kind of easement um called a prescriptive easement which is one that you get through regular and continuous use and so um you know where there might be a trail that has just been used by the public for the last hundred years but the agency never bothered to purchase that right those have conflict over them because there's a dispute between the landowner and the public about whether or not that's a public right and a public easement. And that'll be determined by a judge. And so that's not mm -hmm. something that this bill would address. What this bill addresses is the forest service in 1965 bought a property right across this piece of land. It's a permanent right and you can't take it away. So, you know, it's just more about whether or not the public knows about it, but the right exists no matter what. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not disputable. No, that's super cool. Like you said, I mean, just we talk, you know, access, 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 and that's just another, another big one that could potentially open up a lot of places for, for people to recreate that, that it is, you know, like you said, it's pretty set in stone. It's cut and dry that they, they can do that. I'm glad you said to recreate there too, because that's hunters, that's shooters, that's hikers, that's bird watchers, that's, Mountain bikers, like it affects everyone. It's going to make everyone's lives easier at that point. Absolutely. And, and in the meantime, like a little tip, a little pro tip for mm. people who like to work harder um, to find those secret spots. I mean, if you find a place that like it shows a map, it shows a road on a map, you go to it to like check it out in the field and it just looks a little fishy, like, geez, you know, that looks like it might be a public road. Um, you know, you can go to the local like forest service ranger, you can go to the local BLM field office and you can be like, you can inquire with them as to whether or not there's an easement there on that specific route. And, and they, they should be able to look that up for you. And so if you do your homework, um, you might be able to find, um, some access routes that most people just don't know about yet. And so it might be, give you a few years advantage um in hunting in some areas that, that the, the general public you know doesn't know about but it, it takes some work to do that but uh, it is entirely something you could do so do do your homework now because 20 in 20 years somebody's going to have access to the information <laughs> to get into that spot four years mark we're going to get this done okay i like i like the positive optimism yeah that is awesome no that is a, that is a good little pro tip a lot of this information exists and and it does take some digging, you know, and it goes back to, I mean, I think of like where we're at right now, where we're talking about, you know, digital mapping software, but then also, I mean, I used to do the same things as you, Joel, where you're like, you'd find maybe some, you know, obscure corner marking or like, you know, maybe you do have a map that shows a piece of public, but you know, and you're like, okay, so the scale of the map is this. Okay. I'm starting here. Like you said, get the odometer out. Okay. I've gone this far. Stop. That's where I can go. And then you're, like you said, you're making like a mental line. So we've come a long way. It's a lot easier now. <laughs> Yes. And it sounds like we're going to get even further along. So Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I like all that We're like stuff. a dog with a stick with this one. We're not going away. <laughs> uh, what about, so we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, and one thing that did pass that was a pretty cool thing, and, and maybe in some ways we, we touched on this, uh, talking about the LWCF, but the Great American Outdoors Act. What, what, what are the implications of that? 
Yeah. Um, like back to Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is funded through these offshore oil and gas receipts. Um, you know, the, the program has, you know, always been, you know, sort of received $900 million a year in its account, right? All the way since like, back to 1964. But Congress has always had to appropriate it each year. And, um, and they haven't always actually only twice have they had they fully funded it up to 2020. And so most of the time, you know, it'd come in at like 300 million or 400 million, sometimes even less than that, um, you know, where it was sort of set up to provide $900 million a year for, you know, public access, for recreation, for, you know, public land acquisition, but also at this at the state level for recreation stuff, but way underfunded. And, um, and so that actually first in 2019, um, the, the authorization for the program had expired. Um, that was renewed um, to the John Dingle Act. Um, and so it was, it was the, the authorization was permanently um, restored. And then in 2020, the Great American Outdoors Act passed, which fully funds the program at 900 million. And like I said, it includes that, that 3% mandate minimum for for public access, which is a minimum of, of 27 million, but we're seeing it coming in around 60 million a year, which is awesome. Um, you know, also what the Great American Outdoors Act did that is great is there's a huge deferred maintenance sort of backlog on public lands, like degraded roads, degraded trails, you know, campgrounds, all sorts of facilities are, are run down. Um, they haven't had the money to maintain them. So there was uh, $9.5 billion over five years to um, you know, go into public land uh, maintenance, you know, projects. And so hopefully, um, you know, blade and roads and fixing campgrounds and other facilities and trails so we can get around and actually use these lands was, is a part of it as well. So it's a great victory. And, and I think, you know, the, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is, is the most powerful tool we have right now for providing access to public lands. Awesome. Monumental. That's, big, that's a big deal one right there. It, it's it's a victory of a generation. I mean, it's it's enormous. And the fact is, is it's it's not something we have to worry about anymore either. And that it's permanently done. Um, I mean, obviously, you need to sort of always watch Congress because you know you don't want to trust them too much. But for the most part, it's done. And so we can you know move on um, to other issues to to continue to you know support access and habitat for our community. And, and it's pretty exciting to be able to um, you know move your focus onto other things. Yeah, I'm sure that's definitely freeing up some time. You're like, oh, we gotta, you know, you know, we gotta fight this one again, or you know, let's, you know, we gotta shift our focus and talk about this again. It's like you kind of, like you said, keep an eye on it. Probably a good idea to keep an eye on it, but also you can set it aside a little bit and, and focus on on new projects and, and new issues. Yeah, just imagine if your R and D department was working on a pair of binoculars for 20 years. It's like it's finally good to have them done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rated for space. So be on the lookout. 20, 2041. <laughs> you'll be able to <laughs> use them on that chunk of public land you found. Yeah. Uh, yep. You'll be able to see a colonized Mars from the. Yep. It'll be perfect. <laughs> Don't give away too many of our trade secrets yeah, here, shoot. Sawyer. I, Ryan, can you cut that? Yeah, we're going to have to edit that one out. Man, I tell you what, uh, we've covered a lot of ground here, a lot of public ground, Sawyer. Uh, I don't think I have any other questions. Do you have? Do you have anything that's on your mind still? Or any questions that you had? No, I I I think you're exactly right. I think we covered a lot of things from high level TRCP stuff to actual tangible executional Great American Outdoors Act LWCF that people can kind of glom onto, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is in today's day and age more than ever. It seems like it's what have you done for me lately? So I think people a lot of times need to kind of see that tangible stuff and then they're like oh okay yeah i'm in um so i think that was i think that's good i think that's a really good connection that people need to make joel i guess i would just ask you like i think you've done a really good job so far but like what's your elevator pitch for people to get more involved with trcp and more involved with public lands as a whole whether they're a hunter whatever yeah i mean i think you know first off you know our you know, Facebook and Instagram channels at the TRCP, you know, like us there. Um, you know, also you can go to our website at trcp.org. Um, you know, we have, you can sign up with us for free. And one thing that we do that's really cool um, is we keep hunters and anglers posted on what's going on um, in terms of big policy issues that can affect your ability to hunt and fish and, and the ability, you know, for, 
wildlife managers to, you know, to maintain and produce, you know, abundant populations of fish and wildlife. And, and, and we really sort of provide people with that understanding of when they need to weigh in, you know, what's going on, they should pay attention to, and it's free. Um, and it's a great resource. So encourage folks to sign up for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that's oftentimes my biggest question is, you know, when w- I want to weigh in, when and how can I? So that that's a big one, Joel. Yeah, we make it easy. And uh, I think also just get out and enjoy the fall, right? Um, we got the best time of year ahead of us for the next few months and um, get out there and remember why this stuff matters. Amen. Bam. I love it. Joel, thank you so much for spending the morning with us. Uh, super insightful, enlightening conversation, an important one. And, uh, yeah, just just can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, if you're listening out there, what are your thoughts on public lands? How are you recreating? How do you like to use them? And uh, how do you plan to get involved? So let us know. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.